we walk away from there with a really deep understanding of their um, of their business needs and uh, make recommendations of how to actually move the needle with the trail. Is what my community does. Um, how do we make the Pacific Northwest a leader in what I would call prop technologies, property tech, which is the combination of real estate technologies and digital construction? How do we push forward? I think the biggest problem that we see is getting everybody to adopt VR and AR. So the underlying thing that we're trying to do is make that possible. In some cases, it's purely because of expense. Other cases, it's time. Uh, and other cases, it's just the work involved when people's desires really haven't been met with technology. We're getting close, but I think our day-to-day -day efforts are really taking the latest and greatest that's, that's out there and making it accessible to everyone. And obviously, at the minute, that's that's a pretty poor order, especially when you see the likes of things going on in the media, making it look so much better than it really is. We're doing some things with AR kit right now, prime example. And you see the adverts for the AR kit, but you notice all of those adverts for all this fancy gadgetry, none of us have that fancy stuff working on our phones because they've got just a marketing team behind them to make it look that much better. That unfortunately leads to two things. One, people think everything's that much better cheaper and easier to hold off. And I also think it's better at the end of the day than what it actually is, at least for the 99.9% of the population working off of their phone that's two or three years old. And so our solution that we're trying, trying to do is solve for that gap and try and get as much as we can working on everybody's devices. All right, well, we talked about the what. <laughs> about the how. Tell me a little bit about the why. Why did you guys start these companies? Really good question. Um, from my perspective, the why is that I really do believe that uh, this opens up a whole other realm of tapping what it means to be human. Um, we live in a physical world. We interact in a physical world. We've been forcing, our technology companies have been forcing the world to um, interact with technology on technology's terms. And this is a unique opportunity for technology to actually operate on human terms. We're not there yet. I mean, we're in the very, very early stages of that. But I do believe that, uh, at least in the 10-year horizon, that we will suddenly realize that uh, technology is less uh, something that we have to deal with and it's more uh, becomes part of our lives in a, in a really visceral and personal way that we've never seen before. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot of talk of both the utopian and the dystopian outcomes of all of that. Uh, there's dystopian videos that you can find of ads everywhere in your world, everywhere you go. Um, but hopefully what will happen really is that an ad is only relevant and valuable if it actually resonates with you. And, and, and there is that opportunity it's for even even the, the, the revenue model for all of this to, to be, become more personal and more relevant to all of us. At least that's my hope. Yeah, I, I worked in tech and I worked in construction a long time. The reason I'm really attracted to this is because the global gaming industry is 100 billion. And um, the global construction industry, depending on how you measure it, is between 9 and 12.5 trillion. So we're looking at an industry 100 times larger. Uh, most everyone in VR that's looking at it, how many first person shooters and zombie games? are we going to create? So most of what I'm seeing in VR and AR is essentially people recreating the wheel. I would say 99% of companies are doing the same wrong thing. And I think there's just massive opportunities to digitize both real estate and construction. The market's so vast, so fragmented, that there's room for millions of companies to thrive. And those that digitize will thrive. And those that don't are going to have a difficult time in the future. I would put it down to three reasons. One, because myself and everybody in my company just loves this stuff. Right? It's rare that you, you get a job where everybody, you say, can you get to work for nine because you've got a new project coming on, and people turn up for half day. It's, it's rare that at the end of each project, you feel like you've actually achieved something that, that, that makes a difference. Maybe just puts a smile on someone's face, or maybe, in fact, the very first deal we ever had, uh, a lady was building her dream home. She's been sitting all her life, and she she 
just couldn't get on the same page as the architect. The very first day that we showed her, she didn't want to do a headset or anything, but she said, you showed me on the computer. We showed it to her on the computer, we said, just use the arrow keys to move around, and she cried. Mm -hmm. Right then, we kind of realized, yeah, now this is why we love it. When you can make a difference like that, something that there was no other medium out there that would enable her to get inside her architect's head, but now all of a sudden there was. The second one is consumer demands are still not being met, right? Whether that's especially real estate, touring, building and creating, or even changing things within those homes. Being able to see these things, experience them, is a keyword there before they exist. And, and the third one is this is just a brand new market with lots and lots of unknowns. Well, just as Greg said, this, the potential of this market is ridiculously big. So whatever challenge we face, we know it can be solved sooner or later, and trying to figure that out is just makes it even more fun. Great answer. So if you had to choose between augmented reality and virtual reality, which of those two do you think will more affect the real estate industry in the next five years? That's a tough one. <laughs> I, th this is one area where I absolutely think VR has a really, really strong um, ap applicability. And, uh, and mixed reality, what, or at least what I consider mixed reality, which is something like the HoloLens, um, it's always just not quite there yet, and it has some challenges as far as addressing the, the real needs. But in the five-year time frame, I really do believe that the entire world is going to converge on a hybrid device that actually is, can go either way. Um, I, know, I know there's a lot of research on per pixel opacity, where on every single pixel that you're seeing, it can either be transparent or <laughs> opaque. It can literally make your brain either see the real world or see transparent uh, holographic objects that are ghost-like and transparent like it, this currently is, or completely opaque. And I think that in the five-year time frame, that will just be the norm across the board. Um, price point is probably the only thing that would keep uh, VR relevant for a longer period of time than five years, because it will continue to be the cheapest way into this market. But in the, in the long run, the two will converge and pretty much every device will support the gamut. So, so my answer may be a cheat, but it's a, I, I think it'll be a hybrid combination of the two in, in the five-year time frame, except for at the lowest end of the market. To answer my question, I want to start off with a question. Of the audience here, if you just raise your hand, how many people identify their primary profession involves real estate, architecture, or construction? Which portion of the audience is that? And which portion of the audience is VR, AR, tech, etc.? Okay, we got a good split. And I would guess, and I would like to, here's part of the conversation, that people, how they answer how will XR, AR, VR impact real estate, you will get an extremely different answer if you ask the construction people or the real estate people versus the tech people. And first of all, it's because that's an artificial distinction. How does bits, how do bits become a building? Is the 3D, are you interacting with on a 2D screen, AR, VR, mixed reality? That's an easy problem to solve. The UI will get better, and the web will soon be flooded with billions of 3D models. There are 35 million SketchUp users, 35 million. 30 of them, they create 30 models each year. That's a billion models. So there's billions of existing 3D models out there today. The big problem in the construction is how does 3D data become a building? So when I talk to Boeing or Ford or manufacturers, or the construction companies, or Autodesk, or Trimble, where we had the hackathons there. When you separate XR out of how bits become a building, people kind of don't know what you're talking about. It's just another way to interact with data. It's nothing more. You're not solving that many problems. There's no barrier to entry to someone downloading Unity and buying a headset. And what will really impact it will be AR. It's IKEA. Have you seen the new free app with AR kit? IKEA has been working on AR for 20 years, and they have a patent bundle as thick as this book to sue you with. Do you know how many startups had the dream of downloading SketchUp models of IKEA furniture, bringing them into Unity, and hoping that IKEA would give them 1% of every furniture sale? <laughs> had tens of thousands of startups' dreams crashed when, when IKEA released that. IKEA is not going to do that. IKEA's furniture, as they said, They've been using renderings of 3D models of their furniture for years instead of real photographs. So to me, the business opportunities are in bits to buildings. Everyone has a diverse opinion. 
<laughs> sometimes it's great to go last, and sometimes <laughs> sometimes have two great minds ahead of you. Yeah. Uh, if you could put my accent on their voices, there, I think uh, we pretty much cover the gamut. But I do believe I think the the underlying principle there is that just as Mike said, these things will converge. They've already started to. We. No, I think I'm trying to remember the last time one of our clients said, can you just do it for this one device? It doesn't happen. You want to really reach, if you're trying to make money out of anything here, you want it to be multiple, multiple devices and therefore the best experience. And some people, just like the audience is split, some people for one way, some people for the other. I don't see one completely crushing the other. I think two will just merge. Well, I have a pretty good feeling how Greg's going to respond to this. But I'm going to ask all three of you guys, are you more excited about the opportunity to use or leverage AR and VR with existing buildings or with new buildings, buildings that don't even exist yet? Keep coming up with good, tough answers because, I mean, I think both are exciting. Um, I, I would probably vote for the, the long-term. Mm -hmm. The long-term excitement is going to be um, on existing spaces because it's a harder problem to solve, and there's more magic in the in the possibilities of that. Especially with uh, with the idea of mixing the physical world and the um, and the uh, virtual world. You can imagine a future where you scan a house, and and heuristically, the the um, cognitive services in the cloud know how to erase everything that was within the walls, and now you got an empty shell, and that empty shell now is something you completely populate to your dreams. Um, and, and desires, it. so you can actually, you know, if it knows a lot about you, you can know that you like a certain type of furniture and, and auto-populate that space with the, that furniture. I just think there's a lot of opportunities. All that uh, obviously would also work in a full in a full virtual environment, but I think that the magic goes even one step further when you're starting to uh, apply that to your actual real world, the, a, a real physical space. Uh, Zillow just announced that they're going to support like, Matterport-like functionality. Um, they're going to make that available to real estate brokers. That was in the last week. And then um, Redfin, the local company, is kind of a leader in wanting to use Matterport on all of their listings. And essentially, that we can argue whether that's VR or not, when you can essentially click on different positions within what is semi-3D data and move around a building. And you can put that in a unique URL for a real estate listing. Um, I don't think there's much of a barrier to entry, and I actually think that's what Google and Apple are already working on, where essentially anyone can do that for free with your phone. And you get a really good 3D model of your building, it sells stitches, it's positioning. That's our, that will be free soon. To me, the big opportunities, as, as consumers that educate themselves on the value of navigating 3D space, and they learn how to do that, much bigger opportunities are buildings that do not yet exist. So how do you put buildings that do not exist in that same environment, allow a consumer to configure the home because it hasn't been built yet? They're not only not moving furniture around, they're actually able to choose and modify different designs. So it's in a sense interactive customization of buildings, but then you need to connect that with actual pricing and the delivery of a real building, the people who build them. Other than that, it's just a free design tool, i.e. a game. We started in the unbuilt, so that was all our initial excitement. Right now, where we're seeing a lot of potential, at least, outside of that, just we don't want to repeat everything these guys have said, uh, but there is another area that's pretty exciting, and we just finished one project for the San Diego Museum Park, and they have a part of the building, and then they said, well, what do we do with a bit that doesn't yet exist, right, or a bit that we're going to change? Now that becomes exciting all of a sudden. Uh, because now we can explore both of these worlds again and really see what we can do. Now, we actually took it to the next level and it said rather than just building this place that exists, let's do that, but then also you press a button and you get the space through that door quadruples in size. And in fact, so you can stick your head inside a painting and now you're inside that painting. Right? So you, there's this volcanic one and you literally put your head in and all of a sudden you're on the top of that very same volcano that's out in Hawaii. Or you go into the other room and there's, there's a, um, the bones of a dinosaur. And again, you press a button and this thing comes to life and walks all around you. So we can take the great thing with AR and VR and combining the unbuilt with the built is that we can combine these things that just make our experiences that much better. 
another prime example, especially in the museum, but it could easily work for anything in real estate too. Anything that is built already, they're limited in what you can do. You could have a couple of nuggets to show some information, right? But the unbuilt, it's only limited by imagination. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and go right back to you, Jeff, because uh, you actually touched on the case study. You talk, uh, talked about the customer you have down in San Diego, is that correct? And I'd like to ask you guys, who are the customers today? So I'm guessing there are some entrepreneurs in the room, there's some people both you know, in the industry and also uh, you know, the real estate industry as well as uh, the tech industry. And I'm sure they're curious what your thoughts are on who you could sell a product to today. So let's talk about who those people might be. So back to my initial point, we started in real estate and now spun out. And we still do probably 50% of business in real estate. Uh, most of that is unbuilt, to be fair. There's a little bit of a mix of the others. Uh, what's, what's most fascinating about kind of what our clients are is there is no silver bullet yet. It, it's hilarious to me when I see these startups come out of nowhere and they've got this one thing that's going to save and change the world. But to my knowledge, none of them have succeeded. And initially when we started saying, well, what we want to do is build a platform slowly and gradually and build these components like Lego blocks so we can build a game just as easily as building a house. And that's where we're at. That's where we've been focused. And for the longest time, several of my entrepreneur friends are going, crazy, it's crazy. But you know what? We're still around four years later and some of on. I still think we're a little bit crazy, to be fair. Um, but it would be nice to find that silver bullet that solves all of these problems. But it's just not being able to find. We, we have these ideas, right? We think uh, it'd be great to build furniture that would be bought like here, but here's what he's talking about. Uh, it'd be great to build uh, some components to build a house, but there's Revit and all these other companies that have got these kind of components that do that. So we're eating into their space. That's still not to say there isn't enough market potential out there. The problem is you then need a big marketing budget to really try and tackle these big giants that already exist. It's easy for them to spare oh, a million bucks here to go explore that area, where for us, yeah, that's not going to happen. So back to the initial question, that's a long, sort of long answer here. Uh, but we have definitely found that initially we wanted to make a solution that was for the every, everyday person. We still have that, but most of our clients do seem to be larger scale. They're the ones with the bigger budgets, and to be honest, the bigger problems, right? They're the ones that can it's say, hey, we need, we're doing something in Costa Rica right now. Ridiculously high-end homes, holiday homes, which are better than most anybody's home that I know here. <laughs> but they want something that is absolutely beautiful, and they're, the clientele are throughout the whole entire world, because only a very select few people can afford that. But it means we can now send them a little kit that they can view on whatever device they want to, and be teleported into this location. So at the moment, most of our clients seem to be the high end, but ultimately that will filter down through. Yeah, my, my product, I'm a content person. My content is a building. So how do I use technology to connect with people who want to buy that building? That's work, working as a real estate person for an existing building. Or how do you use these new technologies to sell a building before it exists. So I always look at it, what services do you provide for buildings? And then you don't have to worry much about competition with the Seattle super booming real estate market, super shortage of people who build. Um, I think there's much more opportunity. I, I see, I've seen hundreds of startups at our hackathons excited about buildings. And they all have the same model. They're like, we're going to, the global CAD market is 10 billion that you know, you're competing against Microsoft, I mean, um, Autodesk, Dassault, Nemetschek, and Trimble. It's only 10 billion a year. You know what Autodesk is already integrating with Unity. That was announced very heavily. So when I talk to Autodesk and they see all the startups who generally say, we're gonna take Autodesk FBX files, move them into Unity, put them on a headset, and then they realize they're working with architects. Architects don't wanna pay them much to do that. So then they wanna create a plugin to make it easier to move FBX files into Unity. And then I talk to the Autodesk people who are like, don't they know that we control the FBX standards and we're going to support that for free as a native feature in all of our products? 
So those people are all roadkill. Sorry, that's literally what their view is, as well as Trimble. So you have to be providing, you have to be essentially connecting more valuable data at the delivery of ability with that virtual experience they're using to market it. Because otherwise, I don't, you, don't, you have no competitive advantage also when you assume that architects, you know, say, hey, the architect designs the plumbing and the electrical, and you can see where all that is, and so soon the builders will be wearing headsets on site so they know where to put the plumbing. The problem with that is that architects don't design the plumbing, and they don't design the electrical. And if they do, that's not where the electrical and plumbing ends up. That's these builder people over here. And another perfect example is the Seattle Central Library, a pretty iconic structure. So we've had Huffman speak at our hackathons. At one time, they were managing 250,000 3D CAD models for that single building. The only one they weren't managing is the one from the architect, because they weren't allowed to use that 3D model reference for legal reasons. So I ask a VR startup, which of those 250,000 do you think the architect doesn't want to pay you to put into a virtual environment? And there is no master data model where everything goes into one big model. That largely doesn't exist, and even companies like Automesk and Trimble know that that's not going to happen. Construction companies, architects are going to use a wide variety of software. And where do you provide value for that using 3D data that's web and cloud-based, including in XR environments? on almost every question we complement each other very nicely. <laughs> um, I definitely um, want to expand on some things that like, uh, Greg said. And, uh, it, one of our uh, main clients, um, in our, our first client is CDM Smith, which is an AEC company that builds large infrastructure projects like bridges and dams and water treatment facilities. Um, so we, we did a pretty broad analysis of their business, uh, identified about 22 opportunities that were had a mixed reality, potential mixed reality solution, and uh, boiled it down to three top recommendations, uh, of which we implemented two POCs around two of the three. Um, the one that really, really uh, resonated, which um, is, is very along the lines of what Greg is saying, is the, I, the, the fact that architects design a large project, like a bridge or a water treatment facility, without enough level of detail to actually build it. They, they then hand that off to a whole separate set of engineers who are the construction engineers who, in, in today's world, they literally recreate all the models again a second time with more detail. And, and you can imagine that there's a lot of room for error in that process. And uh, so, so we were focusing on this idea that uh, in that handoff, um, the, a typical handoff involves lots and lots of phone calls between the construction engineers and the architecture, the architects and engineers that designed it. And, just, and they do things like Skype calls, and they do screen shares, and they they'll, they'll, you know, say, they'll look at that particular blueprint. And then that actually, I mean, there's a lot of paper blueprints still in that industry. Um, so, so the aspirational uh, solution that we developed is uh, one where you can collaboratively pull these uh, three-dimensional models into a mixed reality device and have a common context. And that common context is available to anybody around the world. Uh, you can't necessarily fly everybody around to, to, to solve these problems on a construction site. And so, um, it, it, so one of the interesting things that we learned is that uh, to, to have a, the equivalent of a video conference call, but have it be in 3D, where you actually are seeing the models that you're interested in in 3D, is a powerful experience. You really understand what a person's looking at. You can literally uh, point at things and say, I'm talking about this particular pump, this pump. Uh, was was came that the pump that was delivered was not the pump that we actually designed for. Can you help me figure out how to solve the problem? Or the pump is that what a lot of things are custom built and, and often are not quite exactly what you'd expect. So so we um, have been looking at this uh, this concept of using uh, 3D to solve 3D problems in the construction phase, which at that point typically is um, fully virtual. Uh, although I, I'm really glad that Jeff brought up this idea that uh, this this. Uh, mixing of the physical world and a modification of the physical world is, is a really big um, uh, opportunity for mixed reality because uh, as much as a, a CDM Smith would like everything to be new construction, 
uh, at least half their business is retrofits. So they're, so they're doing a lot of trying to add additional uh, additional infrastructure to an existing um, facility. And so there is this opportunity to say, I want to visualize the combination of, the, of, a, of an existing physical infrastructure and uh, and uh, something new that doesn't exist yet. Um, one other thing I want to say is I totally agree with you about the whole uh, uh, the plumbing isn't in the mall where you want it to be. Um, but again, aspirationally, there's building damage management systems that try to uh, uh, keep uh, truth, the truth of what happened, but there's always as-built. How it was built is not necessarily how it's designed or even how it's redesigned by the construction team uh, because of challenges that come up. Um, so there is, an, there is an ongoing challenge to say, okay, well, if I'm going to use it as a, as a tool to see x-ray vision into what actually is there, you do have the challenge of, of knowing what truth is and trusting what truth is. And, and I do definitely think that that's a challenge that has not yet been addressed. But it, again, it's an opportunity to, to use these new technology, technologies to see the invisible, to see what doesn't, what isn't necessarily readily visible without uh, docking holes walls, which actually does happen a lot. You'll not go on the wall just to see what's behind the wall before you actually do a construction project so you know what challenges you're going to face. So I just want to make sure I heard enterprise, I heard rich people, I didn't hear consumer once. <laughs> is that fair? That's where the money is. In the short term. Correct. Right. So entrepreneurs, um, always follow the money. If you're going to be building VR and AR for the next five years, please don't build consumer. Um, I think Apple's trying right now. Uh, I think that might be the only platform that may be interesting to watch for a while. But um, we might... Yeah, we're going to that next. Uh, we'll talk about consumer AR VR with regards to real estate. But I, will, I do want to say this, just for the entrepreneurs in the room. Um, in the VC community, there's a phrase that it's better to be wrong than to be early. So keep that in mind. Yeah, so talk to us a little bit about how you think maybe three, four, five, six, seven years from now, uh, VR and AR will change uh, the world of consumer real estate. Yeah, you go first. Sorry. <laughs> um, back to one of the things that Greg actually touched on. To get mass adoption, which is really what they need, you obviously need the support of the Googles and the Apples. Um, but we also really, we want to integrate these things into every device and into every part of our lives. So I think uh, one area that we will see a big growth in is going to be education. And if we talk about real estate, that matter. Right? It could be, okay, they're going to build these new homes, but how do they teach people how to build them? How do they do tests? Well, in virtual reality, you could have a virtual tool belt with every single piece of equipment on. You could man a crane, right? You could, you could manage a forklift. And so you can do all this training from, from, a, from your home, potentially, which is kind of crazy. But then you can also have those tests built in there, too. And the, the cost of all this training and all the mistakes that could be happening from a health and safety point of view as well could be huge. But of course, again, these are all things that just bring all of these things together. I mean, maybe this is also leading us down the AI path. Right? You know, when you start building this and you've got the testing, you know what's right and what's wrong, and the computer starts to take over. But that's for another discussion. Uh, but certainly, I feel like in the next three, four, five years, these phones, these iPads, for prime example, will be able to take over the place of most of the computers that we have at the minute. I remember when we started four years ago, just running anything on it, had to get the five ten thousand dollar machine. Now, for about eight hundred bucks, is twice as good as those machines were. We're looking at now. We need a double graphics card for some of the work we're doing, which is fascinating to have to do that. But I just look back, and still a lot of the stuff can be now done on the phone. And you just think, yeah, in a few years' time, these phones, these, these devices will also merge so much more and make them compatible to do all of these things. Um, so back to your, your real question there is, I think we're going to have to see this merging of these, of these solutions, all of the different areas of our life, well, also whether it's shopping, whether it's buying a home, whether it's customizing that home, whether it's just looking at those homes, uh, they just need to be on every one of our devices. Really, really get a big consumer data. The iPhone 15. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Um, 
No, I, I think I'm quite confident that I'm, and every consumer essentially is going to be able to scan their home and get a pretty darn accurate 3D model of their home for free far sooner than in five years. You can actually do that now, and you'll be able to do it really well. And you'll also, because 5G will be out in five years, you'll be able to render it remotely, and that is what's going to happen. And media said the same thing. They're getting out of the hardware business, and they're going to have low late, latency support, infinite 3D content in the cloud. They're going to stop trying to get 1080 cards in cell phones, and they're going completely cloud-based. That's public disclosure from NVIDIA already. They're already pushing that. So in five years, you're going to be able to serve up infinite content, render it, and you'll be able to capture it. And I think consumers will be used to navigating 3D environments with a wearable, which will be pretty good within five years. And because they teach themselves how to do that, it's going to create vast opportunities for those people who create the buildings themselves, those who design and create the buildings. Because consumers are used to seeing 3D environments of existing buildings and also moving their IKEA furniture around today so they can decorate the device. But when you're moving towards, but how do you pre-market buildings that don't yet exist and then deliver them what the customer wants? And not only I believe that, I brought this. This is an Autodesk publication in June. And we had the lead speaker speak at our hackathon in July. Autodesk says, look, we own design. We're the dominant player with Revit. To sell an architects to digitally design a building, we already kind of control that market. We're the biggest player within the US. We're betting the farm on how digital design becomes a physical product. That's why this book is the future of making, not the future of design. A lot of CAD software is going to be free. It'll be a subscription based and free and you'll capture it so more and more products will let you test drive that Tesla or test drive that car in a virtual environment that resembles the real world as a way to sell the physical product. So I think the opportunities for startups, whether you're going after medical, planes, trains, automobiles, or buildings, are work with people from that industry who make that product and figure out how can you use XR technologies to help them market, train their employees, how do you put those Boeing planes together, and then also train the, employee, uh, train the people who then build the projects. I think the opportunity there is infinite. So does Autodesk. As they stay here, that market is 30 trillion per year. If you combine the 10 trillion dollar construction industry with the 20 trillion dollar manufacturing industry, it's 30 trillion, and that's where they're going. All to the cloud. It's in the book. <laughs> And I'm not an auto this shill. I love Trimble and the Met Shack as much as they do, but at least they're telling the full story. Forty dollars on sale for twenty-five million on Amazon. Just buy it. <laughs> Just do it. Yeah, I, I would I again I want to expand upon uh, what Greg was saying. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, AR Kit is there is only one company on the planet that basically has the mind share of just about every consumer in the uh, every consumer at least in in first world countries, and that's Apple. I mean, Apple, a huge, huge, huge fraction of the of the uh, population has either an iPad or an iPhone or, both, or multiple. Um, so one, one thing interesting about it is ARKit in some ways is a late player. Uh, I mean, there's certainly, there's a lot of technologies and frameworks in that space already. So why is it so important? It's important because they already have the install base. Um, this opens up an army of development opportunities, right? Uh, now that you know you have the install base, you can build something you know you have an audience of hundreds of millions of people. Um, I think that's good for the entire industry. Apple is going to open it up. I mean, I'm, I'm a Microsoft ecosystem focused uh, company. And I'm actually quite excited about it. I don't think, oh crap, you know, there's my market, it's going to go away. Uh, the reality is they're going to create the biggest pie you can possibly imagine. And it's going to open up opportunities for every single device that's out there because it's going to create an army of developers that know how to do it. It's going to create an army of consumers that are understand it and have already been educated. And uh, so um, the, it, it's a pretty clever move too in the sense that, yeah, they may be a late player in um, creating 2D AR, but Everything gets, that gets developed for a 2D device, you know, for an iPhone or iPad, that, with, with very small modifications, that's going to run on whatever future holographic 3D type uh, solutions and hardware that Apple eventually introduces. So in the five to seven year time frame, but, so the other thing is, Apple owns the supercomputer in almost everybody's pocket, right? I mean, obviously there's install base from, from Android and other devices, and everybody is trying to figure this out, but Apple clearly has a large market share. Um, there's a lot of research going on in 
most of the compute happening in your pocket, and the only thing on your face is the absolute least amount necessary for input and output. So your glasses can become a lot smaller if you just depend on talking that uh, supercomputer in your pocket. Um, there's a, actually a company in, a, it's actually an intellectual property company in, um, in Portland that's working on how do you solve the problem of minimal amount of energy to get the supercomputer in your pocket talking to the glasses on your face when you've got things like arms in the way of those radio signals. You want to keep the battery, the batteries are the real challenge for all of this. And so there's a lot of smart people trying to figure out what are all the pieces of puzzle that have to be solved to make it possible so the glasses on your face to be these stylish, minimal things that do all your I.O. and all the actual power is in your pocket. So I think Apple's really positioning themselves well in that five to seven year time frame to be the one that has figured out that entire equation of creating a developer ecosystem, creating a lot of solutions that are out there for 2D AR, and immediately having a giant library of offerings the second that they have something that's more of a, of a holographic device similar to, to this. Um, and again, I would say that that really will help every device out there. This is very well positioned right now for the enterprise, and Microsoft will continue to develop smaller and smaller form factor devices. Um, but, but I do believe that Apple is going to be the one in the five to seven year time frame that's going to just blow this out for everybody and create a much, much larger pie for, for the entire ecosystem. So you mentioned Apple, you mentioned Autodesk. How many non-30 billion or 700 billion dollar companies um, are really interesting to each of you in this space as it relates to real estate today? <laughs> Let's take it at that word, if I made a start, right? You said there's 30 billion dollar companies. Obviously, one company that's a lot bigger than that, right? They've got 500 million, I think, from um, Google, Google, Google alone. And then Alibaba. Right? Yeah, and then Alibaba, etc. And this thing is just, I mean, it's. It's caught the, the money of a small country all by itself. Um, and yet no one's seen this product firsthand, but very few, and half of those have been killed, I think. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but so where is that going to take us? Who, who knows? But that could well be the future that we're just aren't aware of yet. Um, like about magic week? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, magic week yeah. is not <laughs> It's kind of one of those things that's cool when you were talking. Yeah. Uh, but they don't kill people for the record. No. <laughs> Not to my knowledge. Um, so, but then on the on a smaller scale of things, I do believe there's going to be an army of ant type companies, and I put kind of my size company there, whereby in order for Apple and Google to fully meet consumer demands, they need to reach out to the small companies to do the little things, uh, to do the, the small testing of the, these areas that they're really going after, to do mass user, um, mass user testing. And so I think there's, there's going to be a plethora of these small companies that are going to be essential. A few of them will make it big, I have no doubt. I think there's always these middle grounds, the, the Revits and the AutoCADs, etc., that are just going to be there for the long term. The IKEAs that have been investing for 20 years, which is a fascinating fact. Thanks, so great. Uh, but I, I still think ideas come from these smaller companies all the time. These big companies get slow, they get lethargic, they get complacent, and it's these small, small guys that come up with all the innovation and look at the problem in a different way. But ultimately, again, they'll probably get gobbled up before they get to be that big. This is one problem I think we're facing right now is there are these giants that completely dominate the market. And it's tough to compete with them, but we don't always have to. In fact, I was just down in San Francisco last weekend and talking, I just turned the conversation around and said, so rather than you know, how can you help us, how can I help you? And it was fascinating to get response from such a huge company and hear what their everyday problems are and what they see them going on for the next few years. And it really is getting that, that user testing. I was in a, another random example, but I think it's so relevant. I was in an Uber cab the other day, and you guys probably know, there's a lot of Uber guys who like to talk. But the, the one guy said to me, he said, you know what I think the Uber driver, Uber new CEO really needs to do is sit in an Uber car for a day. 
get that experience of really what it's like. And that's the problem with these Googles and these Apples. They, it's easy for them to lose touch with what the everyday person really wants. But as long as they keep reaching out to these startups, they keep getting involved, they keep coming to meetings such as this, right, just hidden in the background somewhere, they, they can keep that relevancy. And so I do think there's going to be a, an army of these smaller companies that are the foundation of the world. Yeah, and actually I'm an extreme optimist on these technologies for companies of all sizes. Here's why. Um, Autodesk doesn't design buildings. Neither does Trimble. They don't build them either. And I don't think we're going to see Google construction and remodeling anytime soon. I just don't. Uh, they have to chase massive, massive markets. And already globally, and that's what Autodesk is confirming too, there's an extreme shortage of people who know how to connect collaborative 3D design with a digital way of making a physical product. Boeing's been sold on augmented virtual reality for over 20 years. Paul Davies was on my panel at Immersi a year and a half ago. He said, we're sold. We know our aerospace engineers should be using XR to collaborate in the cloud. We know we should be training people to do maintenance on the planes and training everyone with headsets. We've been sold for 20 years. We're just waiting for the technology to be mature enough and that they have a form factor that our workers will actually choose to wear the devices. Some of the biggest impediments are cultural. People like those look geeky. They don't look cool, so I won't wear them. So I think there's infinite opportunity if you engage with a company that makes a physical product and you're using these technologies to help them market it, to help them engineer, design, and train people how to use them. Because a lot of people who make things are not very digital, and they need to digitize, and they need digital people to work with them to tell them how to do that. Hoff, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is your company the most interesting small company with a HoloLens headset? <laughs> it's everywhere in the top. For me? <laughs> no, um, uh, to, be, to be fair, Finger Food, uh, based in Vancouver, um, British Columbia, is, is doing really great work and, and they're one that you should follow. Um, we, we definitely have, have been following some of, some of our plus competitors. Uh, Studio uh, 216 right here in uh, Seattle is doing really great work in the real estate market. If anybody um, here is interested in what's happening in HoloLens in real estate, I would definitely talk to Rise or, or anybody there at Studio 216. Um, so there, there are a lot of interesting companies doing really interesting work. Uh, Case Western is doing some interesting work in the medical field. So, so we, we definitely are doing great work and, and people love what we're doing, but we're definitely not alone. I'm, I'm thankful there are a lot of other companies that, that are doing really exciting work in the, in the holographic and the space. We're coming up on time here, guys. So what we're going to do is give uh, Hoff a little bit of space to set up a demo section. So if you guys are interested, um, after we do Q&A, come up here and take a look at what it's like to look at um, a build inside a room about this size uh, of a future building that's, how big is that building? Left. Probably one and a half times the size of this room. So that's kind of fun. Uh, if you're interested in that, that'll be up here. Um, but now, we're going to start asking some questions. So I'm going to take the first one right over there. Uh, my question is about time, right? As an entrepreneur, I need to know, like, am I wasting my time going after a mark that's not going to be around in my lifetime? You know, so, right? So if, I, if I'm putting my energy and effort towards something that is not going to be around in the next 10 years, I need to be spending my time doing something else or my money, right? So as I'm going, I need to know, like, from guys like you, is it really worth my time or is this a dream? Who wants that one? I do. Despite you hear me say some critical things about some startups chasing markets, I'm a super big believer in this. That's why I invest all this time organizing these events. And I, what, what, what I can give you is single advice. Whatever market you're trying to disrupt, go talk to progressive people who've been working in that industry for 20 years who are drowning in data and tech and saying, can you tell me this technology, what I'm trying to build, does it solve a real problem for you? Do you think there's a real market here? Don't hang around a bunch of technical people who want to create a technology a solution for a problem that may not exist. Then you are wasting your time when we're drowning in opportunities with real problems. Now, I'll pass it off. 
I would say if you think the niche that you've got is 10 years time, it may well be time to start thinking of something else. The trick is that there's a happy point between what's available today, what's tomorrow, and what's in multiple years time. If you think about something for right now, you're probably too late. If you think about something for 10 years time, somebody else is probably going to be to it. Now, so I don't know exactly what your idea is, right? But I would say if you can, try and solve to your greatest point. It's a pain point. That's the key. If you can find a pain point that somebody has, address that, talk to the right people who have that pain point and see if they're interested. And if it's something you really love to do, talk to even more people because the first few people you talk to might give you the right answer. It's not to say it's still not a great idea. Talk to a good range of people you talk to people who know those people and the people outside in the circles there before you make the decision. And then ask them for money. Don't just <laughs> yeah. ask them for their You know, when I, Boeing came to some of our hackathons, and like when I talked to Boeing, obviously a lot of smart people, a lot of engineers, a lot of amazing stuff, they're like, Greg, we make a plane, we get $200 million. All of our focus is, how do we make one more plane? It's, we, we can't veer into other things. We can't afford to because if we can make another plane, we're going to make all that extra money. We got all that big market. So people who chase other ways of people chase helping us do that better, they're bringing value to the company. And people who do things that we can't do or not don't have time for, you're great. They're the big opportunities there. And the same thing with Autodesk. I was in a meeting with Autodesk and McNeil. Anyone knows Rhino and Grasshopper? That's another CAD tool based here. McNeil. Um, He's like, we can chase things Autodesk can't, because Autodesk has to go after billion markets. We have a hundred million dollar market, they can't afford to focus on that. We can't, hundred million dollars is enough for us, for a while. So it's a lot of low hanging in that sense. Right, so for me it was just, the question was more because I wanted to know, you know, should I implement AR, VR into my platform, you know? Um, I'm already in the process of doing something. Like this is the reality, this is the future. Should I shift course a little? Should I make a right, you know, even though I'm trying to do the same end destination, should I add it to the stop? Right? Jeff, That's what I'm trying to figure out. Jeff's point, I think, uh, was talk to the people who are your customers today and find out if that's going to add a lot of value and solve the problem for them. Did I hear you right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely feedback is crucial. We, we notorious in, in my company for doing gazillion tests. I come from an analytics background, very risk averse, but you wouldn't necessarily believe it when you hear me speak sometimes because we will test three different prototypes of the same thing sometimes. Sometimes we just know that's the one and that's the only way. We made a big change this morning because we were developing something for Victoria and we said, you know what? We think that'll work better in AI. We'll give a better end user experience. But we didn't just switch it. We just said, let's pause it. Okay, you've got four hours. Just show me that you can prove that this is going to be a better experience than that. Same thing goes for Unity versus Unreal. There's always this, this big debate, is which one's going to be better. There is no clear answer to that, but the key thing is, okay, let's try both for a small period of time, some small test, let's get some user feedback, let's get some end user feedback, bring that together to make a conscious decision, is this the right one? Right over here. Question. Um, I'm watching a little bit late, so I don't know if you guys discussed this or not. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, a few of the larger barriers to entry in VR, AR, and real estate specifically? Yeah. <laughs> um, when I got, I got my real estate, I was shocked how real estate agents were losing any money on anything. Like how many of you get really great photos of your nice house for 150 bucks? You have a, somebody's a professional photographer come out, take amazing photos, and tweak them in Photoshop and give them the same day. I'm like, really? How do they make a living? But I'm shocked how many real estate agents take photos of million dollar houses with their cell phone and they don't edit them and they're really crappy listings. So my shock of real estate agents is, man, they're, they're not generally able to spend a lot of money on a listing, and they're going to make $20,000 off of it. And they're not willing to spend 100 bucks. That's a barrier to entry. A barrier to entry in architecture and construction is legal liability for owning the model. 
Example, you want to have someone send you the model for that new building, and they're under these massive NDAs. And if that model leaks out, they're going to get sued out of existence, going to destroy their billion dollar company. No, they don't want to give you their model. No, they don't want to share. We've had hackathons where we had people from really prestigious architecture firms come to the hackathon and say, we're not allowed to share models when we're working on the same projects in the same room. So why are they going to give you a startup that model? There's a lot of legal viability with owning physical world data, or data that will become a physical product. If it's just a zombie first person shooter, don't do Walking Dead, do something else. But my point is, that those, those, you need to talk to people in the industry, same with medical. You need to talk to people in the industry, who owns the data, how is it created, what are the point points, and can, will they actually give you the data? I also encourage you, if you're looking at construction architecture, to talk to that man right there, David D'Arza, the president of the Revit Users Group with a thousand members right here in Seattle. So that's frontline experience on how data is used for designing buildings. Where Sala sitting next to him works for Selling Construction, another billion dollar construction company. Also knows, yeah, those are two people, for example, that are from the industry that would be great people to talk. How is data actually used? I can use some of Can I actually yeah. expand on that a little bit because Greg's touched on it? But there's actually, I think, a, a more important barrier to entry rather than the NDA and the liability of showing what a design might be. Because what, what's interesting to me about this conversation is that if we believe what, uh, what's, what I've been hearing over the last week throughout all the different meetings at uh, Startup Week, everything is moving to the cloud. But the one thing that isn't is the building. At the end of the day, the building <laughs> still has to be built. The building is a place where the floor physically has to hold you because you know, the cloud isn't solving the gravity issue that we have just yet. Um, but there's, there's a really big problem in that it's not just, oh, I don't want to show you what my design might be because somebody might copy it. There's a, if I put something in a model that turns out to not be something that can be assembled, and it's going to cost extra to assemble it because the data that I put into that model does not allow the builder to do it right, who pays for that? Who's liable for that? And at the end of the day, you, know, the, you kind of have to think about who are the consumers? You know, we talked about consumer technology at one, one point. Well, the reality is that buildings at a large scale, the consumers of that, the end consumer is us sitting in this room, that somebody paid for this building. And the person that paid for that building doesn't care what new cool technology you're using. They want the building built. And some might be more visionary than others, but at the end of the day, they don't really want another line item for VR. And a lot of the technologies that we're talking about with AR, VR, XR, they end up being a little bit more useful than entertainment. A little bit more useful. But the problem that Greg was starting to allude to, to how do you get that from that digital information to the stuff that gets built, there's a huge gap there. Uh, you started talking a little bit about training, maybe uh, operating the crane. So you have to think about why do we create 3D models in construction architecture? It really has to do with the fact that we can't prototype it. So we're trying to virtually prototype it. So maybe look at the models from that lens. Like what, what is the real uh, deliverable of our industry as the building? What is the model for? And I think that you will unlock a ton of value there. You know, somebody sitting in, a, in an office with a VR headset and looking at the real surroundings of the real site with the real design and visualizing, oh, I have a massive uh, uh, blind spot with the crane where I'm gonna need to have another spotter. The technology is there today to do that really, really easily. But are we doing that? Th those are the things where we have huge gaps that we can fill in with technology that's available today. And you can do that and bring a great deal of value. Yes. Demos, questions? I just had a quick question. I know you alluded to the uh, training component of it. Um, I was just wondering if you guys wanted to expand on that a little bit more. Because I know uh, a lot of the work I do is in the workforce development and just uh, you know, dealing with uh, you know, how you move forward in some of these areas where 
we're just not seeing the workforce, the skills gap in this region especially is extremely uh, large and how ARBR might be able to uh, just, you know, solve some of those solutions. So. Yeah, so I, one of our, in fact, our first big commercial project that we did, it was, it was really funny, we, we built a, and in fact it actually touches on your barriers to entry too. So they had a very smart team, it's a very wealthy company, but they were using a, a software that was very inefficient, right? So they they heard about what we did through a mutual contact, they said, oh, well, maybe you could try this for us. They gave us this file, two and a half gig, just for this file alone. Um, but today, let's say it's Greg, the, they would say, hey, Greg, i got a client who wants to see the building, um, can you make some time to show them? They're going to be here next week. Oh, Greg will say, well, actually next week's pretty busy for me. I've got another 17 clients I'm showing this stuff on. Okay, well, can you pass the file to somebody else? Well, no, because it requires my supercomputer not to run this because the file's so big. Um, okay, when else can you work? Well, I'm free in three weeks' time. Well, that's not good for the client. So you get this big barrier straight there on being able to, to share that, that information, certainly. Um, when it comes to the, the training, what we found was we managed to get that file, we reduced it, reduced it right down, we made it work on an iPad and on a live headset and on a computer. We showed this audience and there were six people. Halfway through they stopped, then they went and got more people. By the end of it, there was 40 people in this room and that's where it became fascinating. The CEO even came in and he said, okay, I'm saying for five minutes, he ended up saying for 45 minutes. And it was fascinating to see these different areas of the business actually clicking together, saying, hold up, VR and AR can actually be the melting pot of all of our brains. It can get us on the same, on the same plane. They then said, well, is this, if you've got it on the iPad, does that mean we could give this to the, the guys in the field who don't have all the knowledge and expanse? They don't have to run down to the communications room to pick up a big folder with all the details, go over there, and hopefully pick up the right bucket of paint and the right tools and, and do this as planned. I said, absolutely. This is stuff we can do today. Um, what's fascinating is they didn't use us for that secondary part, but they're doing it themselves, right? So there's a certain amount of give and take. But to me, I actually like, I call that co-opetition. We're feeding each other ideas. They figured out, you know what, we can actually do some of this in, themselves. That's actually okay. Because there's other companies that can't. They proved there was market value in doing that. So I'm more than happy to do it. Uh, there's another company that we started building, the, the Massing, all right? We just built some Massing stuff. They then passed it on to the engineering team who then got involved. So we want to put the, we want to overlay that with some of the electrical stuff. And, and there's electrical guys who then got together with the, the steelwork guys and then we put that stuff together and then we found, hold up, there's, there's a problem right, right out the gate. Uh, because all of a sudden, some of these, these beams were interfering with where these, these cables went, and the same with the HVAC system. And it was fascinating to me today that they weren't doing, this is a huge company, but they weren't able to see these problems up front. Uh, so again, you know, we're still in contact with these companies, and some of them turned into other companies, some of them have just been idea sharing. Back to the barrier of entry again, I think the key thing is knowledge and expectations that are out there. People think, turn switch and you convert a Revit model into something that we can use on our devices and it looks beautiful. They forget about all the little intricacies around that and how long that takes. The amount of clients that will say to me, so what can you do in two weeks? And we're lucky enough, we can do actually do quite a lot, but it's very rare that we can meet all their expectations. They think, how long does it take you to, to actually get these the you know, initial buildings from the architect, existing plans, or how long does it, does it take you to build the house? There's all of this stuff takes time, but there's an expectation setting. People just don't have a clue right now. Uh, but again, once we start really bridging the divide between these different organizations and bring them together, where they can then, especially when things go into the cloud, they can be working on the same system and complementing each other, I think that's when everybody wins. Yeah, I think there's infinite potential. Think of the days of flight simulator training people, and now Caterpillar is training people on heavy equipment. And there already is a big company that trains people like cranes that's now using VR and AR. And they have all of the media to do that because they've been training people like cranes forever. Why aren't we teaching mechanics or people who assemble things and everything in XR and VR? I think it's completely cultural and barrier to entry because, okay, one story. University of Texas at Austin, 
the head of construction management, go over and talk to this head of architecture school. And I said, what software are you using? Because as soon as everyone gets out of here, the architect's going to be setting 3D models to the building, you guys are going to be fighting. And the head of the school of construction said, well, I've never been to the Department of Architecture. So why would I do that? That's the problem. It's not a technology problem. It's a, it's a behavioral problem. The technologies are incredible, getting better every day. But what's the business model? Who's going to pay? Who owns it? Who's liable? So those are, to me, the issues. It reminds me of a conversation I had with a gal named Devin Zweigel this summer. She's the head of the uh, Stanford Review down in the Bay Area. I spent some time down there. Um, and she said that, she said, I would take most problems in the world over coordination problems. Because I think that the crux of why things don't work the way they should is simply a function of coordination problems. And I think that's to your point. They're not talking. Um, so there's, there's no coordination going on. So, you know, if, you, um, if you're interested in what's going on in AI and VR right now, it might be an interesting play to try to get some of these different parts of the stack as a word to coordinate together and use a similar technology. Um, just an idea. Uh, I think we're just about done. We've got 15 minutes left with the space. I want to make sure some of you guys get a chance to come up here and check out this really cool tech. You've probably been seeing some of the things that he's seeing uh, that aren't here, but kind of are. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, Greg travels all over the world coordinating groups like this. Uh, he's been to, what, six countries? Yeah. Six countries coordinating these. He's done 30 plus hackathons. Um, and you've got a group here in Seattle, is that right? Yeah, I do want to do it. We're Damon, our partner, uh, is in London right now. Right now we have our third architecture, engineering, construction hackathon happening in London. And he's in Sweden where we're talking to BIM Object. BIM Object is the biggest repository of 3D objects for architects, 21 million. Then we're at, we're at the Real Estate Tech Week in New York City having a real estate hackathon next weekend. And what I want to do, that's, they have a massive thing called Real Estate Tech in New York, and there's all this venture capital flowing in. How do we make Seattle one of the leaders in, let's call it, prop tech, <coughs> real estate tech, or digital construction? I want to help do that. So please join me. I even have a Facebook group called Seattle Prop Tech. So I want to be going to meetings once a month where people who are interested in this stuff are meeting. Because I think it's a massive, massive up here. A booming real estate market, a booming construction market. We, we're the, we're the, we are the global leaders in residential real estate innovation with Zillow and Redfin, right here. And Paul Allen did the Smart Cities investment. Bill Gates invested in the $3 billion development in Tampa, Florida called Dream It, which is prototyping 3D cities. <coughs> so we have the money, we have the market, we have the tech, we just need to have the industry come together. There was an article some of you guys may have seen yesterday or today. A company called Fly Homes. They were actually on a panel that we put together Tuesday. And the next day, they announced a $4 million funding round uh, by, I think his name is Daryl Cadmans, the guy who funded, who started Blue Nile and Zulu. Anyhow, um, that's important because uh, another startup that was on that panel, Loftium, which made the front page of the New York Times about a week ago with their uh, Airbnb for a down payment swap. You can get a down payment from the bank and then uh, take some of the rent from your Airbnb on a room for three years and pay back the down payment. Cool product for millennials. Uh, those two companies have been trying to get everybody in the space, um, so any company, to move into physically the same space. So like a real estate tech accelerator. So I just leased three year space up in Capitol Hill and I'd probably move in there. Um, but I think that will be a really neat space. You should find out about that. Definitely sign up for the prop tech th uh, thing that Greg was talking about, and all of this stuff will be converging pretty soon. So, um, and I do, I do have one that I want to rent space to it. But I was I did a great job with Loftium in that panel. A lot of cities around the world have these digital real estate, real estate tech co-working spaces and events. For example, the one in Copenhagen that's going to open in May. We're going to have a hack about there. Seeding five for 500 startups, funding through 2028. They want to partner with Seattle tomorrow. Also Stockholm, also Helsinki, also Singapore. They're all like, wait, you guys have the booming real estate market. Amazon's based there, Microsoft is based there. Where do I do when I want to plug into the real estate and construction tech 3D city community in Seattle? Where is it? 
we can create it just by essentially having those meetings in that community. Anyway, try some demos. Come on up. There's a lot of I just want to tell everyone uh, thank you so much for being here. And I especially want to give the warm thank you and applause to our distinguished panelists today. Thank you guys. That's it. Thank you guys for coming. It's almost the end of uh, Startup Week, so try to get to one more week if you can. Otherwise, you guys have a great weekend. See you next time. Dave and I used to send me watching the screen, but I was actually having a conversation with one of our developers in Portland while we were doing that.